A few days before Christmas, it seems as if winter somehow got interrupted. A week of mild weather and rain did its work well in erasing most traces of the previous period's snow and ice. I'm not complaining. For me personally, the mild weather brought about a much needed sense of relief from having to both shovel snow and battle the ice. Snow is certainly beautiful as it lights up the world around you and almost magical as it gently falls on the ground, each flake presumably in its right place. But regardless of weather, each day starts pretty much the same here on the farm. I walk around checking the essentials, seeing if there's eggs waiting for my customers in the farm shop, and if there's meats in the freezer. Do my animals have water and feed to start the day? I make sure everything is in order as I gently ease into a long day's work. Before going to bed last night, I noticed that the sheep were running out of minerals. During winter time we feed them a constant supply of granulated minerals and salt licks, which is essential for their well-being, as they don't get all the minerals and nutrients that they need from the grass that they eat. And for anyone wondering whether or not we got a white Christmas, the snow started following the following. I usually try to feed the layers carrots in winter. Not only does it provide them with something to do during the dark winter months, but the carrots also contain something called beta carotenes, which has the advantage of making the yolk a little bit more yellow, which is always pleasant when you're eating an egg. Even though most of the layers have found their way up into the nest boxes, there are a couple that decide to lay their eggs straight on the floor. 
so I need to go pick those up. Those I'll take in and share with the family. No. I found an egg where there's not supposed to be an egg. I know there's one layer and she always has a corner in there where she puts an egg. Um, so I know where to find them. I know where to look by now. But yeah, more snow and tomorrow uh, there's going to be a storm coming in. Not as bad as the one in a few weeks ago I think. Uh, not as much snow but it's going to be a little bit windy they say and uh, yeah, more snow, but more on the slushy side, not on the cold side. Because the last snow was really, it was really cold when it was snowing. So it was very light and very fluffy. The snow that's coming now, when it's around zero or plus one or minus one, it's, it's very heavy. So um, that means that I have to be extra careful with the polytunnel and everything to remove the snow from it. So, so I don't ruin the plastic or anything. So. But yeah, I like um, I like the contrasts, really. I like the contrasts of hard work and uh, and then relaxing. I'm outside for a few hours working hard physically and then I go in, I light a fire, spend time with the family and uh, it's, a, it's a meaningful form of relaxation. It's not just being lazy, it's actually you feel that you've earned it in a way. So, yeah, but uh, I don't know if I'm going to be shoveling uh, this snow, it's not going to be so much, a few centimeters, so, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is Ture, a modern descendant of the true horse. A mobile and adaptable creature with origins dating back tens of thousands of years ago on the American continent. It is believed that his ancestors migrated across landmass connecting America and Eurasia and eventually making it to Central Europe, where it settled for thousands of years north and south of the Pleistocene ice sheets, covering the land where we now live with ice up to a kilometer thick. His ancestors are long gone now, most likely hunted out of existence, but being mobile and adaptable is probably what saved his species through domestication some 5,500 years ago. However fascinating the history of domestication is, and the question of what made some species choose to live a life side by side with us humans, here I am, thousands of years into the process, clearing snow from one of the structures that helps protect the layer hens from the harsh elements of winter and the dangers of predators. It is this long-standing bond that I think first drew me into keeping livestock in the first place, that I get to spend my time and work hard to somehow upkeep the promise that humans and animals made once upon a time, that we would take care of each other in a mutually beneficial way. I'm probably feeling a little defeated by winter right about here. 
It's been several consecutive days of clearing snow from the roof of the polytunnel and trying to clear the sides from piling up too much snow, pushing in on the wind net that stretches end to end of the tunnel. Sometimes it's important to be honest when you've lost the battle. It's okay to quit and continue another day. At least I got a little bit of workout today.
Water is the driving force of all nature. These are the words of the 15th century Italian Renaissance artist and scientist Leonardo da Vinci. I recently tried a new automatic waterer for the layer hens. It uses gravity and a float mechanism to supply them with a constant flow of fresh water. The container holds 40 liters, which is an improvement to the two previous waterers that only held 5 liters each. This lets me fill plenty of water once or twice a day and feel confident that the layers will never run out. This is especially important for chickens, as the only way they can lose heat on warm days is through their feet, their comb, panting and spreading their wings. By drinking lots of cool water they can help regulate their temperature and stay hydrated. When chickens do not have enough water, they will also stop laying eggs as their body cannot function normally if it is dehydrated. Water also has a vital role to play when it comes to their digestion as they are the only livestock we keep that don't get water from their feed. The sheep and cattle are ruminants and hens only eat forage and grass which at some point can contain up to 60% water content if it's really wet. Speaking of water, snow. There are many sayings in Zen Buddhism that I find both insightful and enlightening. However, there is one I do have a problem with. It goes, the snow falls, each flake in its appropriate place. I think it means that behind the sometimes seemingly random or even chaotic succession of events in our lives, as well as in the world, lies concealed the unfolding of a higher order and purpose. Although all these might sound very nice, it's difficult to accept when you're slipping around at the top of a ladder with freezing fingers, trying to remove the snow that's fallen on an inappropriate place. But really, who am I kidding? The laws of nature don't take into account whether a person is decent, kind or hardworking. It just does its thing. And hence, here I am, at the top of a frozen ladder, removing wet snow. I put up these hoop houses the first year we had signed our names on the lease to take over the farm. As the existing buildings do not provide sufficient shelter for the animals, I needed to improvise. They have definitely served me well, and made it possible for us to even have animals on the farm. But as they are both portable and relatively cheap, they are not built to handle the incredible weight of snow as it piles up and eventually becomes heavy. I think it was Harold Kushner, the American rabbi and author, who once said, The happiest people I know are people who don't even think about being happy. They just think about being good neighbors, good people. And then happiness sort of sneaks in the back window while they're busy doing good. Now, I'm not sure that's the case for one of my closest neighbors. But it does seem that he is at least happy in letting me borrow his little excavator for any uses I might have for it on the farm. Last time I ran it was at the end of the summer, when I used it to empty the straw beds in the animal sheds, in preparation for winter. And not having charged the battery since, I needed a little help getting it started. Today, its task will be to help grade off some layers of gravel under the shed where I usually park my tractor. Having built the shed to fit my old tractor, a Fiat 11090 with smaller and lower frame, I never had issues getting under the main beam holding up the roof. However now, with the recently changed brand new tires on my new tractor, 
In combination with the piling up of snow and ice on the ground, all hope of getting under has been lost. The only solution is to try to get through the ice and slowly scratch away at the gravel underneath, hopefully winning those centimeters I need in order to park the tractor back in its home, well protected from the harsh elements of winter. I consider myself incredibly fortunate having grown up as a kid close to nature. I spent the first seven years of my life on an old farm, no longer active. My parents were journalists and had no time or interest in farming, but as a little boy I had the freedom, tranquility and the good luck to grow up in a place with wide open spaces, meadows, forests and even a short walk down to the sea. Now, as a parent myself, I feel incredibly blessed being able to raise my kids in a place where the natural world starts at our front doorstep. As a child, I believe having positive and fun memories from being in nature is massively important in building a relationship to the natural world. At least for me, my longing in later life to reconnect to nature after having spent most of my teens and twenties in major European cities would probably not have been as vivid had I not had those positive, nurturing memories growing up. Nature to me was a wild and interesting place, full of things I didn't understand but wanted to get to know. It was maybe those remnants of a childlike curiosity that led me back to the land again after all those years in the concrete jungles. I feel incredibly blessed being able to offer those kinds of memories to my own children. Regardless of what they do later in life, they'll be able to build a relationship with nature that feels familiar rather than strange and obscure. After all, one of the central challenges of our time is to embrace our kinship with a more than human world, our totemic self, and integrate that kinship with our scientific, cultural and technological selves. And everything as we know starts in the early years.
Another breathtaking morning is upon us. I didn't see the cattle in the shed this morning, where they usually spend most of their time, so I'll go looking for them in the paddock behind the barn. After more than 10 years of keeping livestock on the farm, I finally feel as if we have found the right place for them come winter. Last year the cattle were stuck inside for six months, which was in a way a relief for me, as the likelihood of them ever escaping a paddock due to a falling tree over the wire was non-existent. However, I noticed that they weren't happy with the setup of being cooped inside all winter. Cattle are curious creatures and want to explore, and even though the grass lies dormant under the ice and snow, they do still have the natural tendency to go looking for something to nibble on and perhaps eat. I'm so happy with this year's setup of having them outside year round with the protection of the barn whenever the weather is unfavorable. And even though there's no way of asking them directly whether or not it's true, I do get a sense that they're happier now than they were last year. And that's all I need in order to feel that I've done a good job. Farming and family life have always coexisted side by side in my life as a farmer. Our firstborn came just a year after we had bought our first flock of sheep and decided to take over the farm from the previous tenant. It's not easy balancing family life and childcare with having the responsibility of also caring for animals. There are so many needs to take into consideration at once and being there for everyone when they need you almost never works out perfectly. As the weekend rolls around, my wife and I have laid out a plan for the day. My to-do list includes cleaning out the chicken coop, for which I need at least three to four hours in order to complete the job. Meanwhile, she's taken the kids to go see a movie while I stay home and work. It's an arrangement which works out well for us both, as it gives me plenty of time to do what I need to do without stress, and I feel happy knowing that they're out somewhere having a good time. When I first became a parent, I got some advice from a friend who already had kids. He said that in order to succeed, you need to lower your expectations of yourself. He continued, take your current expectations and cut them in half. And then he said, and then when you've done that, cut that in half as well, and you're good to go. I think that was pretty sound advice as it's more often than not our expectations of ourselves and the people around us that lead us feeling frustrated and unhappy. Somebody once said that reality minus expectations equals happiness, and I believe that to be true. It certainly makes the everyday a little bit easier when you don't also have to battle your own inner ideas of how you and things around you should be different from what they are. One of the first things I had to learn as a farmer was the art of composting. The contents of the bucket on the tractor is a combination of wood shavings and chicken droppings. 
One is a byproduct from the Swedish lumber industry, the other a byproduct of keeping animals. Previously, I thought you could just throw hay and leaves and branches and manure into a big pile and let nature do its thing. But making a good compost which will benefit your fields or garden with the nutrients for growth it needs in the spring is truly an art form. Composting is, in its broadest terms, the biological reduction of organic wastes to humus. Whenever a plant or animal dies, or leaves its droppings on the soil, the remains are attacked by soil organisms and large soil fauna, eventually reduced to an earth-like substance that forms a beneficial growing environment for plant roots. This process, repeated continuously in endless profusion and in every part of the world where plants and animals grow, is part of the ever-recurring natural process that supports all terrestrial life. As a farmer, you need to be an active participant in this amazing process of nutrient cycling. By making the conditions absolutely perfect for the microorganisms and bacteria that nature provides us with, for the marvel of decomposition and ultimately new life to take place. What we're collecting here in the chicken coop is mostly carbon and nitrogen, two of the most important building blocks of life. Carbon is found in the core of stars, it's the fourth most abundant element in the observable universe and the 15th most common in the Earth's crust. However seemingly abundant, carbon and nitrogen are incredibly precious and can easily become depleted from the soils where all our food begins its journey. As animals eat, they may not take up all the nutrients that make up their feed, be it grains or grasses. After having been used for maintenance and growth, the leftovers come out the other end. Some might regard this as wasteful, but in keeping with how nature itself functions, seeing animal manure as a valuable contribution of nutrients back into a natural cycle where it's been turning for millennia is a more helpful perspective. Animals have their natural place within ecosystems and their ecological niche is hard to fully replicate and replace by man. Humans, with our ability to understand some of the most complex processes of life, both large and small, can act in ways where we use our intelligence and skills of cooperation to participate in supporting the upkeep of life on Earth, both on its surface and in its soils. I would argue this can be the ecological niche of our species during our brief time on this planet. However far we seem from fulfilling that role as a species, perhaps due to the fact that we seem a lot better at understanding how to manipulate a process long before we understand the consequences of doing so, it's important to find one's own true reasons behind why we do what we do. It all might start with asking ourselves the somewhat obtrusive question how do I build a relationship to the natural world so that I can understand its pain and suffering? Then, and only then, can we begin to ask ourselves how do we find new ways to restore the goodness of life? The answer upon which might dictate our whole entire basis for continued existence on this planet.
Whew. It's cold. It's really cold right now. We had minus 23 Celsius last night. It's maybe minus 22 right now. So um, it's really cold. And uh, we've had a water line freeze up by the animals. We have two water lines. One is okay, but one is frozen. That's where the horses get their water. So we're gonna have to carry water today to them. But there are only two of them luckily, so yeah. I'm not doing that right now, but up in northern Sweden, there's a tradition of putting hay, dry hay, in uh, both in your shoes and in your gloves to keep it insulated and warm. It's called shoe hay. Um, I haven't, uh, even though we have a lot of hay, I haven't tried it yet, but uh, maybe it's something to try next uh, next cold spell because it's going to be really cold today and tomorrow but Tuesday and then the f rest of the week we're actually gonna get a bit of relief it's gonna be on the plus side even about zero plus one degrees Celsius so yeah it's gonna be a lot of melting a lot of ice forming but uh, the winter battle goes on and I'm keeping the fire in the house going. It's burning basically non-stop now. From morning till late evening. Yep. But I gotta keep moving. It's a bit too cold to sit still. Det var bara den som hade fryst. Sjukt bra.
The 1962 Nobel Prize in Literature winner John Steinbeck once wrote, What good is the warmth of summer without the cold of winter to give it sweetness? He sums up my sentiment very well. Even though the challenge of working outside to keep the animals well kept certainly increases as temperatures drop and days get darker and shorter, there's always a larger perspective at play here. What's revealed about life is the impermanence of everything. That in a way, as in the words of the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. The central idea is that there is a unity in the opposites, that processes, changes and shifting relationships is the only real experience of everyday life, that life is in constant flux, always becoming but never staying the same. It's certainly a helpful thought, as even in the midst of winter, summer and the conditions for life and growth is in a sense slowly becoming. And so, days pass, filled with familiar and seemingly repetitive chores. But in the spirit of impermanence, there's so much novelty to discover, as nothing is ever the same. Perhaps there is hope to be found, in that life is temporary and uncertain, and touching this notion might help us experience life as more precious, valuable, and something we shouldn't just take for granted. Perhaps, by living through the days of winter, we can learn to live a deeper and more appreciative life, as one only knows the sweetness of the warming sun after having felt the burn of the arctic cold. Winter shows us, in its harsh and direct way, that being deprived of something for a time can in fact show us what it is that we value and love, as we end up longing for it in ways we wouldn't have had it never been taken away from us. If there is any meaning to be found in the metaphorical winter with which humanity and the world now seems to be descending into, it might be just this, that with every passing day of us losing sight of the common norms and values that once brought about the most peaceful time in human history, our creeping but certain descent into an increasingly fragmented and disorderly world we need to remember that we are entering into a new season, where things might seem very dark and frightening right now, but we must never forget that we can and should use wintertime to plan the coming of the new seasons ahead. Spring and summer might seem too far away to grasp, but as sure as there is day after night, summer too is slowly flowing towards us in the river of time. And when it comes, we must be ready. <laughs>